Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to thank WWF and the Swedish um, Energy Department for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I'm going to tackle two or three things. First is the, the basic idea of um, unburnable carbon in the context of carbon budgets. And then I want to look at, if you're an asset owner, if you're an investor in the fossil fuel sector, um, what, is, what do you need to do? What is your relationship with these companies? And what do you do at the portfolio level? So my background, I spent the last 25 years in asset management and uh, corporate finance in the city of London. And through that time, I saw a growing number of fossil fuel companies IPO and raise money. Coal particularly was popular, as was oil and gas. And during that time, there were more initiatives about climate and climate finance than uh, I was sort of NGOs almost. I was struck by everyone wanted to talk about climate. But the paradox was investors were allocating more and more capital to the fossil fuel industry. So um, I was tr intrigued to get the answer to a one question, which was if you added up all of the reserves owned by the world's largest coal, oil and gas companies and converted those reserves to CO2, how much CO2 would you release? And I started playing around with these ideas about 10 years ago, um, thinking that somebody else had done this. It's it it an obvious question to ask and uh, not finding anyone to have done it in 2009, 2010, I set up Carbon Tracker and we produced our first report, Unburnable Carbon, Other Markets Carrying um, a Bubble. And then people sort of took the basics, okay, we buy the, we buy the idea that there's more fossil fuels that's listed on markets and can possibly be burnt. Uh, how much new capital is being allocated to expand in the fossil fuel sector, which then led to um, our second report, Wasted Capital and Stranded Assets. And then others then say, well, okay, this is really an allocation of capital question. It's a carbon budget question. Give me the names of the companies that are going to win in a low carbon world and tell me who the losers are. And that's really an economic question. And that led to the latest series of reports called the Carbon Supply Cost Curve. But in the middle of all of this, and if you'd read uh, my first report, you don't see the words divestment anywhere in there. Uh, but Bill McKibben from 350.org, um, we only published 200 reports. I thought that this was going to be an interesting question. I had another job. Um, I thought it would go away after we distributed the reports. Um, what I didn't know is that one of the reports ended up in the hands of Bill McKibben of 350.org, and he produced this extraordinary article in Rolling Stone magazine. If you like good writing and enjoy uh, almost poetry, he produced a beautiful piece of writing which continues to sort of strike me every time I go back and read it, uh, and it's worth reading. And he launched the divestment campaign. And I do this see these presentations, um, in the US, and um, I, I've got colleagues in Canada now, and um, we've also done a little bit of a tour. And everywhere we go, what we've seen is large endowments and pension funds challenged on their fossil fuel investments. So I'm just going to quickly go through the basic carbon bubble concept. We've heard it before. On the right-hand side is the final remaining carbon budget, well, the available fossil fuel reserves in red, which is 2,860 gigatons, is tied up in reserves. So this could be economically extractable, that we know is there. Um, and then on the, the other red bars is, depending on who you ask, um, mm -hmm. this is the IPCC uh, give their own estimates, is how much fossil fuel can be burnt to avoid two degrees. And then you've got ranges of, of probability. And then you've got um, the sort of this light, uh, lighter green color, which is uh, emission, emitted all emissions to 2011. And then above that, you've got uh, non-CO2 forcings, like emissions of methane and other global warming gases. So clearly what we have here is a budget issue. And I look at it as a budget issue. I look at it as future capital expenditure and future emissions. The last 10 years, we've tended to look at what did a large UK corp a large international corporation, what were their emissions, like a Walmart? That's important to understand that. But the real key to this is understanding future emissions. So what did our, what in, a, in a nutshell, what did our report say? Well, there's the, the, the figure up there and again in the red, around 2,800 gigatons of CO2 in known oil and gas reserves around the world. What's listed on the public markets um, around the world, so um, all the oil, all the coal, and all the gas is 745 gigatons. That's just the reserves. The reserves are the ones that the companies will tell you are, are ready to be extracted, ready to go, and ready to be burned. But depending again on who you ask, the remaining budget to two degrees 
uh, is around 565 gigatons. It's a range. It's somewhere between 565 and 900. IPCC put it at 1,000. So when we hear the phrase, the carbon bubble, which I coined in our first report, the bubble is not necessarily a financial bubble. It's a carbon bubble. We say it's a carbon bubble because um, the blue uh, doesn't fit into the green. And that is why it's a carbon bubble. So where is the capital being deployed? So we took all of those 200 listed companies and we, we took it stock exchange by stock exchange. Um, and when I said we, there was only two of us doing it at the time. So we used a lot of computers and Bloomberg terminals and uh, reports and accounts and other databases. And there's three key markets, sort of Moscow, London, and New York. Uh, the oil is in the blue, the coal is in the gray, and the lighter color is the gas. And that comes from our 2013 report. But where is the capital actually going? And the disappointing news is that in the next 10 years, there's going to be a huge expansion of fossil fuel financing. So in the next 10 years, $7 trillion will be spent on expanding coal. Um, if you look at what happens to London, London goes from being an oil base to becoming a coal base. London bets the future on coal. And you'll see the southern hemisphere economies, Australia and South Africa, uh, and then the Asian economies really go for coal as well. The figure that the IEA puts on um, coal, oil and gas financing to 20... I'm going to get this right. 2050 is $23 trillion will be spent on more coal, oil, and gas. Now, $23 trillion in the context of a global economy sounds a large amount of capital, but um, other factors taken into account, it, it, um, it's a relatively large figure, but what is clear is that with that, you could be deploying that into other more productive investments. Um, so the other thing this highlights is we have a system-wide problem. What we've heard today is people decarbonizing portfolios. What I'll put to you, what we really need to do is decarbonize the capital markets. It's a financial and regulatory issue. It's the listing rules of stock exchanges. It's the accounting treatment for, for reserves owned by coal and gas companies. Um, it's what the companies put in their regulatory filings. Um, I, I launched a report at the UNCTAD Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative um, last month uh, we analyzed the 200 coal, oil, and gas companies for their regulatory filings. What do they tell their shareholders? And what we find is that only one company stress tests their business model on a two degrees outcome. Most of the coal, oil, and gas companies assume business as usual and that we'll continue with this trajectory of more oil and, and, and gas will be burnt. And so I put it that what we should be as investors doing is, and how we engage with boards, is really push them on what are they disclosing um, about, about changes to energy policy and what it means to their businesses. The other way of looking at this map, I'll put it, is that when it comes to Paris 2015, you're gonna, you're gonna have hundreds of governments and thousands of policy makers and politicians running around trying to get in an agreement. If we manipulate the way we regulate financial markets, there's only two markets here that really count. Let's put Russia to one side at the moment. It's New York and it's London. If we change the way capital is raised for the coal, oil and gas industry through the regulatory filings and their disclosures, there's only two economies that count. It's New York and London. Now, is there anyone whose job as a regulator, when they get up on a Monday morning to go to work and say, I will look at the risks to financial stability into markets from the fossil fuel industry, the answer is no. Nobody inside the central banks or the financial regulatory authorities wakes up with their job to say, is this an issue? And the reason for that is because politicians don't say it's an issue, and we don't have politicians engaged with the way financial markets are regulated by looking at climate. You'll hear them talk about financial stability, you'll, talk about, you'll hear them talk about financial reform and about Basel III, and you'll hear them talk about the banking systems, and you'll hear them talk about bankers' pay, but do they talk about this issue no, they don't. Until two weeks ago, Mark Carney, governor of the Bank of England, says not all the fossil fuels can be burned. When you ask him, well, how many years ahead is the Bank of England allowed to look in terms of financial stability, you know the answer. Maximum is three years. They'll only look at risk in an 18 months to three year context. Ten years is way beyond the time frame of, of, of regulators. So there we have an issue. So how much time have we got left, as he looks at his watch on my, my tour, is I'm interested in the trajectory of emissions 
And at what point do we go through the two degree budget? And we've heard it before, based on our calculations, and these are different scenarios. You've got the IEA 450 scenario, or the new policy scenario, uh, which is the yellow line. You've got the IPCC uh, in the orange line, which is more like business as usual. And then we've got it flattening out uh, in the blue line. Based on current emissions, um, here are the two time frames that we, that we go to. There is somewhere between 18 years and 30 years before we break through two degrees, and then we break through three degrees. Why is this important? If there are any actuaries in this room, or people who work on the actuarial side of pension funds, if you start inside a pension fund as an investor at the age of 18, you'll be there until the age of 65. You're doing asset liability matching for your portfolios. 50 years suddenly looks like um, a short time if you're an actuary because you're just balancing the investment portfolios to meet obligations in 50 years' time. In the middle of all of that, we go through the two degrees and three degrees. So this is why um, my colleague Jeremy, who chairs Carbon Tracker, uh, gave what I thought was one of the most interesting speeches in terms of the responses to the Institu Institute of Actuaries. Do you have something similar to that here in, in Sweden? Well, the Institute of Actuaries in London um, is actuaries who work with the large corporate pension funds who look at things like asset allocation and risk. And they thought that this was quite a fascinating slide because you can start to plan your asset allocation and your exposure and management of risk when you think of this uh, as, a, as an I issue. And 30, 40 years isn't a long time if you're thinking of as an in institutional investor. So is the fossil fuel industry betting on unsustainable future? What did Carbon Tracker do? Well, I thought the only way we could deal with this is to buy into Carbon Tracker Wall Street's and the City of London's best and leading oil and coal and gas analysts. So that's what I've, I've, uh, we, we've done. We brought in the ex-head of oil and gas, HSBC, Paul Spedding. We brought in Mark Fulton. And we brought in um, a bunch of other of his colleagues who've, whose backgrounds in Deutsche Bank and Citigroup for the very simple reason as the oil and gas industry uh, say, OK, we're going to take you on a deep dive of detail and you're going to get lost in the detail. So, OK, well, we brought in our own firepower. We brought in people who've been covering these companies for 20 to 30 years. And then we bought the Rystad Energy Database and then we bought the Woodmac um, energy database. And the reason for this is we wanted to look at all the projects which are planned by the coal industry and by the oil industry going out the next 20 to 25 years. And then we wanted to map, map it economically on a cost curve. To go back to the question of where do we find winners and losers. So we now produce a series of very detailed reports on the oil and uh, coal industry. We've just published coal uh, about two months ago and we will do gas shortly. Why are we doing this? Because there will be a battle between governments and corporations as to who has the right to burn the last barrel of oil and to mine the last ton of coal. People, corporations will say, it's my right to sell that last barrel of oil, and governments will also give the same arguments. And the answers have to be eco um, driven economically. So um, we, we, we looked at the, um, this is, I'm going to look at oil for, um, we haven't got time to do coal. Uh, we looked at it in the context of a carbon budget of two degrees. We then looked at the role of private sector capital allocation as opposed to government. We then looked at all this capital expenditure by the oil industry uh, and started to stress test it against new business scenarios. And we developed the concept of the carbon su supply cost curve. And then we, we looked at a break-even uh, price of a barrel of oil to justify the economic extraction of that oil. And so what this um, shows you is uh, in terms of actually what goes to market, private companies or, or listed companies is around half. We know governments control 70% of the known uh, fossil fuel reserves. Uh, but in, in terms of the public markets, it's about 50-50 between the partly listed national oil companies and by, by private companies. And so the, what that allows us to do is allocate a notional 360 gigatons of CO2 to the oil industry and start to begin to work out, do governments get a bit of the budget? Do corporations get a bit of a budget? Where does private equity fit in? Where do the listed companies fit in? And then we developed this idea of a cost curve. So what this is, is just sort of your classic um, supply-demand um, equilibrium economics. So you take a notional budget, which is the red line of 360 gigatons, so the CO2 runs along at the bottom up to 700 gigatons, and then you say, OK, let's map the cost of production for 8,000 oil projects around the world against this cost curve, and then work out at what price 
does supply and demand equal, which is around somewhere between 60 and 80, 85 dollars a barrel. We actually have a break-even um, price slightly higher than that. And what that will do is that if prices are below 80 dollars a barrel, they probably get produced. And if um, oil is at 150 dollars a barrel, the oil industry is going to produce all the way up to the type right hand side of the of the cost curve. So. Having got that basic analysis, we then went away and using the Rystad Energy database, we then looked at all the different oil projects and all the different oil companies. This is a report you can download off our, web off our website, and we have three technical reports that sit behind this that go into demand scenarios and supply scenarios. So on the left, we have um, what projects have to achieve above $150 um, a, a price for a barrel of oil to actually make money. And what you're beginning to see here is that in the last few years, the cost of production for the oil industry has gone up. All the easy oil's gone. If you want to explore in the Arctic, it's going to cost you over $100 a barrel to produce it. Where is oil today? $78, $80 a barrel. What we have is an oil industry investing shareholder funds in projects that don't make any money. Here's one of the secrets of the oil industry. Last year, it paid its dividends, not from profits as a whole globally, it paid it from borrowings. It borrowed from the bank to pay dividends. When you hear people argue we need these companies to support because we need their dividends, the dividends aren't coming from the profits of the oil industry, it's coming from bank borrowings because they're investing in projects with negative returns on capital. So what Carbon Tracker we're trying to do is build a narrative that says these are companies which are not profitable. If you're an owner of that company, what you ask them to do, you should be asked them to do is stop deploying capital in projects that don't make any money, and by the way, are outside of the two degrees carbon budget. And here's the other thing people have said, well, are you telling us to divest? We've never said to, to, to divest. If you don't deploy capital in um, projects which will be redundant, but return it to shareholders in the form of higher dividends or share buybacks, does your share price go down? It could go up. We could potentially use the legacy projects of the oil industry to pay out high dividends as we transition to a low carbon future. So we, we also analyze for shale oil turns and extra heavy oil, and then we work out where, which, com which projects around the world are the highest carbon, the highest costs. If the Alberta tar sands get developed, we really have a major um, climate problem. Um, and so that's the, the um, part of the world which we're most concerned about. And here we map against our cost curve different types of oil, offshore shelf, on, onshore, uh, ultra deep um, water as well. And this again is in our report. The report we produced two weeks ago, which you can download of our website, we looked at all the Canadian tar sands projects. 92% of all of the undeveloped oil sands in Canada require a price of above $95 a barrel to make money. So what you're seeing from that is the oil industry is facing some real challenges. Here's Shell's um, um, return on capital deployed falling, even at with um, Brent at $120 a barrel, we know it's come down. So what it's doing is investing more capital and actually getting a lower return on, on capital employed. CapEx, which is the red, is going up, and this is for all of the oil industry whilst production is going down. Here's another way of showing these graphs, so I want to show these very quickly. What this shows you, the three oil, oil majors, Exxon, Royal Dutch Shell, and Chevron, this shows capital expenditure going up and production going down. And we know with oil at $80 a barrel, we've, we, have, um, we have a problem. Um, and there it is um, falling. So what are we saying to investors? The key thing is to engage with the boards of management. Part of what we should be really thinking of is what is the answer to the question, who owns the company? Is it management or is it the shareholders? We have a tradition, um, certainly in the US and the UK, um, that shareholders own companies and it's for the boards to justify their strategy. What we're saying to uh, institutional owners of these companies, engage with the boards, vote your shares, challenge CapEx, look at these. So what we have here um, is our reports you can download. These are the seven oil and gas majors. We looked at all their capital expenditure. And we're looking along this line, who, who's, who are the losers, who's at risk, and who are the survivors in a, in a, C, in a two degrees world, in a car carbon constrained world. Probably going to stop on this slide so we can maybe have some questions. One of the, people one of the questions people asked us is, 
Is this a financial bubble? Is the unburnable carbon a financial bubble? And I want to answer that one directly. Um, we've not said it's a financial bubble. We've not said that. One of the reasons why is that the investment bankers are resisting doing the analysis. These are the sell-side brokers. So if you work for one of the AP funds or one of the big asset managers, the, the default position of the sell-side banks is all the coal and the oil is going to get burnt. They don't accept two degrees or three degrees scenarios. And so in their models, they assume all the reserves will be extracted and all the resources will be extracted and all the capex will take place and there'll be the return on capital. Um, now, what I want them to do is reconfigure their models to assume that actually we're going to hit two degrees. And the reason for this, this is an HSBC slide, is what it shows you is what proportion of the share price is made up of revenues going out. And what you'll see for it, most of the valuation of a typical, well, any particular, uh, any company, but in this case an oil company, is made up, uh, most of it is going out 10, 15 years. Okay? But look at what proportion actually is beyond 10 years. 60% of the net present value of an oil company assumes revenues going out more than 10 years. And there, we have the potential to do some analysis which would demonstrate that there is a financial problem. And I, would, I believe if the work was done, that we would find a situation that if we even got to three degrees, a lot of these companies are sitting on pretty shaky valuations. I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop there. Thanks Thank very you much. very much, Mark. <coughs>